Hi, I'm James Crow at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, and thanks for joining us at Lab Roots 2021. Uh, today I'll be discussing uh, the discovery and biology of protective SARS-CoV-2 human monoclonal antibodies. Now, <clears throat> of course, we're all pretty much done with uh, hearing about COVID. We've heard so much about pandemic, and we'd like to be over it. But I think uh, I'd like to use it really as a case study in uh, current approaches to discovering monoclonal antibodies and how to characterize them. And I'll be talking about some uh, published activities that we've had in the past year, uh, antibodies that have gone on to the clinic and been successful, and then some unpublished work on new specificities. So <clears throat> let me start with just the, the timeline during the outbreak when we were called upon to uh, conduct a rapid antibody discovery program for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so we're part of a DARPA, or a U.S. government, DOD agency program called Pandemic Prevention Program. And the idea was to make antibodies within 60 days of an, of an outbreak. And we were simulating outbreaks in 2019 and preparing for another simulation in 2020 when, in fact, COVID occurred. And we were called upon not to simulate an outbreak, but to respond to an actual outbreak. The sample that... Um, that I'm going to speak about today um, came from individuals who were infected in Wuhan, China in December 2019. Uh, they uh, traveled to Toronto, Canada, and, and by March they were convalescent. They were about 50 days out and so therefore had circulating memory B cells. And uh, so we obtained the sample in collaboration with um, investigators uh, in Toronto. That sample was lost for a little bit at the airport, eventually arrived at Nashville with the help of uh, FedEx Special Operations. Uh, we expanded the B cells, sorted them with pre-fusion stabilized spike protein that we'd made recombinantly. Um, then we used a, a microfluidic platform called the Beacon from Berkeley Lights. And this is a collaboration with Berkeley Lights. They brought in the Beacon to our um, facility really about a week before we started and sent in application scientists uh, to work with us. We did the single cell cloning and obtained monoclonal antibodies in the third week of March um, and then obtained the um, sequences. Twist Bioscience synthesized those for us into our expression vector for immunoglobulins. We did many transfections and microscale purifications um, and started characterizing those antibodies uh, we did neutralization assays with uh, pseudotype viruses, with chimeric VSV viruses, and with authentic viruses uh, in collaboration with Mike Diamond at WashU. And all of those uh, assays were helpful, although the authentic virus really tells you uh, the, the most accurate IC50 for neutralization activity. And also the chimeric VSVs, not the pseudotype virus, but the chimeric um, replication competent VSVs also give you an accurate IC50. Once we had done the screening after about two days, we knew we had very potent antibodies. Uh, we assembled the neutralization anti uh, antibody data and down-selected to sequences, and we transferred those to a pharma par partner, AstraZeneca, on April 8th. So that whole process from sample to lead transfer to the pharma partner uh, was done in 25 days. Uh, we looked at these for in vivo protection in um, various types of mice with Michael Diamond and also Ralph Barrick at UNC, uh, and then ultimately in uh, primates with Dan Baruch. So th this just shows you that uh, these sorts of single-cell uh, rapid processes can be done very quickly in, in a matter of weeks. Uh, and these antibodies are not just theoretical um reagent types of antibodies, but they actually were put into clinical trials, uh, which have now been successful. So to give you a little more detail about how this actually works, the, the beacon is a microfluidic device, which has little pens. Each of those pens um, is available to deposit a single B cell in the bottom of the pen. And those B cells, if they're activated, they fill up the pen very quickly in about 20 minutes or definitely within an hour with secreted antibody, which spills out into a main channel. And um, we uh, put into the device um, beads, streptavidin beads that are complexed, in this case with spike protein, which 
captures the blue secreted antibodies, and then we were able to detect the secretion of specific antibodies using an anti-IgG secondary that's conjugated. Um, and on the top, you can see binding to spike protein or to the receptor binding protein, the receptor binding domain of the spike protein that we made. Um, and we found an antibodies that would bind either or both of those reagents. Um, so this is a very effective assay that could be performed very quickly. Now, I just, I, I think it goes almost without saying that the, the impact of next generation sequencing, which came from the Human Genome Project, all of those instruments and technology, and also synthetic genomics revolution, which allowed us, in particular with our partner, uh, Twist, to synthesize um, antibody genes in, in a matter of days and put them into expression vectors. So when we see the next generation sequencing, not only have single cell, we can do bulk sequencing of entire repertoires in peripheral blood and generate genetic lineages um, of somatic variants. So on the left, you're seeing a single clone or clonotype. It's really a clone in this, this case from a single person with samples taken at different days. And the, the individual antibody we, we got from a cell shown as a little triangle, but sequences um, were represented in the next generation sequencing. And we can make all those as proteins, thousands of somatic variants, and look at them for activity. Um, another uh, advance that really made this possible uh, in this instance was using, as I mentioned before, the replication competent recombinant vesicular stomatitis virus. Um, uh, uh, competent viruses that were expressing SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. Uh, and these were uh, made by Sean Whalen's group at WashU and shared with us. And um, we have looked at the correlation of authentic SARS-CoV-2 neutralization on the x-axis and the activity this is a log scale. The activity um, against the, the replication competent VSV and there, there's a linear correlation. So uh, Paul Rothloff and, and Sean Whalen uh, put these together, and they've been very helpful to us in the antibody campaigns. Another major advance for us was uh, something that was really um, discovered or invented in our group by um, Pavlo Gilchak, who's a very talented staff scientist at Vanderbilt, um, who has been developing real-time um, assays for neutralization. And this is based on a principle called cell impedance. So we have an, an instrument um, uh, built by a company, ASEA, that is basically a 96 or 3D4 well plate that has chips in the bottom of them, and those measure, measure electrical uh, impulses. And if cells cover the bottom of the well and make tight junctions or at least seal the cell-to-cell -cell um, adherence properties of a monolayer, then adherence goes up. And so on the x-axis over time, um, you see the the evolution of the impedance. On the y-axis is the impedance measurements or the cell index is really the value. And you can see as we put cells on from 0 to 24 hours, cell impedance goes up as the cells fill in. If we add virus um, without any antibody, you get a full cytopathic effect in the the impedance goes back to zero. But if you have neutralizing antibodies, as in the green curve, uh, you see that we maintain or even increase the cell impedance. And some antibodies only partially protect, which is in the red curve. So this is a real-time assay that can read out very quickly in about a day after we ap apply the virus, and we know uh, which antibodies are protecting. And again, we did many uh, correlations to show that this um, this real-time um, assay correlates very well with authentic virus nude, VSV nudes, uh, nanoluciferase nudes with uh, Ralph Barrick and so on. Um, another thing that um, uh, helped us during the early discovery was thinking about combinations of antibodies with a rational design, not just throwing two together, but thinking about what is the best way to do that. And so on the left, uh, Elon Benstein in our group took uh, pairs of antibodies that we knew did not compete and uh, did single particle EM reconstructions of the binding of the FABs, in this case, an FAB called 2130 in yellow and 2196 in purple, 
uh, complex at the same time on a recombinant RBD antibody um, or RBD domain, excuse me. And so both of these are RBD antibodies, but they, they are able to bind at the same time. And that gave us confidence that there was enough uh, area on the RBD to accommodate two antibodies. And we looked through, and these two particular antibodies on the right, we did what are uh, called synergy uh, experiments in which you, on the x-axis, go from zero to a high concentration in nanograms per ml of one of the antibodies, 2196. On the y-axis, the same for the other antibody, the yellow 2130, from zero to high. And you can see you don't see any neutralization at at zero, uh, but there are concentrations for instance, 8 nanograms per ml here with 2196, where you don't see any neutralization. And at 63 nanograms per ml for 2130, no neutralization. But if you cross those two, you get nearly 100%. So you can do complex calculations uh, with synergy scores to identify when synergy actually occurs. And so uh, this is great because each of these antibodies are very potent in and of themselves, and each one would probably be fine but together we get even more bang for the buck with a synergy, uh, and that's great. So um, as I said, we, we did various types of animal studies. Uh, in the beginning, there were no really good animal models. Uh, Mike Diamond took an adenovirus and transduced the lung of live mice with human ACE2, which was rapidly determined to be the receptor. And of course, mice don't have human ACE2, but the adenovirus transduction could put the gene in there, and now they have human ACE2 in their lung, and we could uh, inoculate them with wall-type virus and get replication. And this is the the weight curve, so uh, the animals lose weight in the black curve. But if we give them either one of these antibodies I've been talking about, 2196 or 2130, uh, we preserve uh, the, the weight. And you could do various things like histopathology. So untreated, you see consolidation in the lung and lots of lymphocytes, whereas in the treated... On the bottom, looks like a normal lung, so that's a good effect. Um, we also uh, looked at these antibodies, uh, even as monotherapy, in non-human primate models, macaques, where we gave the antibody um, the day before and then challenged with authentic virus. And uh, Dan Baruch's lab had developed a subgenomic uh, RNA test to look for newly made RNA, so not the input RNA, but only newly made and in neither the nose nor the, the lungs do we see a single copy of RNA with, with this antibody 2196 or, or a similar antibody 2381, whereas in an isotype control treated um, uh, set of animals, you see nice virus shedding uh, in both the nose and the lungs. So um, we're seeing a, you know great protection in small animals as well as non human primates. So this was a go signal that... Uh, this type of antibody with this type of neutralization potency uh, was attractive to move forward. Uh, and so many antibodies that we made at, at, at Vanderbilt were looked at in preclinical studies and down-selected, and then a handful has been studied uh, now in the clinic or is in clinical development. AstraZeneca has been our major partner, and they've done, I think, six or seven phase three trials so far uh, in the ProVent trial is a prevention trial that um, has now been announced as effective with, I think, 77% of protection against any um, COVID infection symptoms at all, including upper respiratory tract after prophylaxis. Um, the, the JPO program of uh, DOD with the um, their um, manufacturer, Ology, also has made uh, a, a different antibody cocktail that's being looked at and military personnel and ID Biologics uh, is looking at another set of antibodies. So AZ has studied these antibodies all over the world in multiple clinical trials, formats, prevention, uh, treatment trials are still ongoing, and so on. Um, of course, when uh, variants of interest and variants of concern started coming out, then it became apparent that we needed to look carefully at the epitopes uh, being recognized by these antibodies, because if variants of concern escape the antibodies that are in development, they would no longer be very attractive as therapeutic or prophylactic molecules. But in fact, um, we, we've now gotten the co-crystal structure of 2196, which is shown in pink and cyan, 
and 2130, which is in yellow and salmon here on the RBD um, in green. So we get both FABs in complex with the receptor binding domain as a single macromolecular complex and did the, um, the crystal structure at high resolution. Um, Chen Wei Dong did this in our lab and it was uh, recently published in Nature Microbiology. Um, and we can see the particular residues that are recognized by these, these FABs and that's very helpful. And then we can go out and, and look at, um, various, um, point mutations that are occurring in variants of concern shown in the various columns. And we have compared, um, these antibodies 2196, 2130, or the combination, which is what's being developed clinically for, um, uh, change in activity and, um, in IC50. And we can see these, these antibodies are still very, very potent single nanogram per ml IC50 against all the variants we've tested, including Delta, which is the major variant circulating in the U.S. at this time. So, uh, these antibodies recognize highly conserved residues, uh, and that plays out in terms of, as predicted, broad and potent, uh, neutralizing activity. Um, now we did not only make, you know, three or four antibodies, we made uh, thousands of antibodies to date. And it's interesting, I'm going to pivot a little bit and say, other than the receptor binding domain in which you see, uh, both strain specific recognition patterns and broad recognition patterns, um, there are other, uh, sites that are recognized in particular, the, uh, and terminal domain. And so I want to look at that a little bit because I think uh, these are occurring in people after infection and also after vaccination with a full uh, spike vaccine. And I think you want to be aware of uh, what's going on with the NTD antibodies and understand their, their utility and their limitations. So, um, so in the next section, I'm going to talk about human monoclonal antibodies against the N-terminal domain of spike. Um, now we, we identified a large number of, um, of NTD antibodies. I think well over a hundred, maybe, maybe close to 200. Um, but, um, most of them were not neutralizing, interestingly. So they would, uh, they would bind to, uh, the, the NTD protein, but not neutralized. But we found several that are bound to spike protein, the ectodomain, also to just the um, recombinant ND, NTD portion of spike bro- protein and uh, and also neutralized virus. So that's quite interesting because there's only a very small subset of NTD antibodies that potently neutralizes. And um, one of the reasons we think the NTD is difficult to recognize uh, for neutralization is because of the complex glycosylation um, uh, patterns on the spike protein and also the the uh, open and closed or up and down um, positions of uh, spike. So Watanabe and um, science has shown these these patterns of glycosylation and it's very complex. Um, but it, these p- two particular antibodies uh, that we focused on uh, that were Neutralizing, if we do a competition, um, experiment in which on the y axis is the, the second antibody and the first antibody is a blocking antibody and, and look at which antibodies compete with each other. Um, these two antibodies that neutralize, they do compete with each other. And so they, they recognize, uh, basically the same, um, uh, epitope or antigenic site at least. And we know that they do not block ACE2. They're too far uh, afield for that. So 2196, I showed you before, is an, an, an ACE2 blocking RBD antibody, but the NTD antibodies don't have that property. Uh, now we have gone on and uh, determined the structure of these in complex um, with spike protein. And you can see they're quite far off to the side because of their, um, their recognizing the NTD. So 2489 on the left, 2676 in the center. Uh, the, the pink, uh, or blue structures are the FABs and in the center is a spike protein. And if we superimpose them, you can see they, as suggested by the competition data, they are binding in a very similar, uh, place. And, um, 
Also, um, it's quite interesting if we look at the the um, antibody variable genes, the the V genes, and the, um, of the heavy chain and the light chain. There is um, diversity being used there. Although, if we look at several other um, NTD antibodies in the literature, from Chi et al. and Lu et al., um, there are patterns where you see uh, sort of VH169 has a shared VH, and this probably has to do with the um, the hydrophobic CDR2 that's encoded by VH169. So there's some genetic diversity of antibodies at the NTD for neutralization, but maybe some conserved elements. Um, we have gone on with um, with integral molecular Ben Dorrance and uh, Edgar Davidson in Philadelphia um, to do uh, single alanine scanning, single residue mapping, and we know the individual residues. If you change them to alanine in a in a full library, that abrogate binding. So the loss of binding residues are are shown up. Um, in the top left, and you can see their position in the spike protein on the side view or on the right uh, from the top view. So they're quite lateral, and that fits with the single particle EM reconstruction that we saw. So we know exactly the residues that are being recognized by these NTD antibodies. Now, um, not only uh, can we do loss of binding with alanine scanning, another way to do a sort of functional mapping is to create escape mutant viruses. Now, I showed you the real-time uh, assay before, the RTCA, real-time cell analysis neutralization assay, with X axis being the time and Y axis being the cell impedance. And you can see with um, uh, various um, uh, instances, particular wells that we pulled out of a 3D4 well plate, the, the impedance goes up and then it falls back down, which it shouldn't do that because this, these antibodies are neutralizing. Uh, and, the, and the reduction in cell impedance means that virus has escaped. Um, and so you can see whenever there's a down arrow, the impedance is going down. And so we generate escape mutations, mutations for these antibodies, um, which look very similar to no antibody, whereas if we use a 2196 RBD antibody control, cell impedance goes up. Uh, and so if we if we take the contents of those wells and sequence them, we can determine the the uh, sequence polymorphisms that um, mediate escape. And they're very similar to the alanine scanning um, uh, mutations that we, we occurred. So this is a functional mapping as well. So you have loss of binding or loss of neutralization are two ways to do fine epitope mapping. Um, another thing, we were trying to understand the mechanism of action. Uh, it's pretty clear these antibodies, you know, in a neutralization assay, they don't need um, the FC region at all, uh, probably. I mean, they're not interacting with FCR because there's no there's no antigen-presenting cells. There's no FCR-bearing cells in the assay. But we were uh, interested in whether you needed bivalent binding. Um, and so we compared a, a full wall-type IgG with FAB2 forms where we cut off the FC or just an FAB form. And it's interesting, uh, the FABs um, of these antibodies completely lose activity. The FAB2 has a moderate reduction and the wild type has full activity. So uh, we think that the the size of the antibody, not necessarily the um, uh, bivalent binding, but the, the size of the antibody um, probably uh, it plays a role with NTD and the smaller it is, the less effect it has. Um, now, we did uh, take these antibodies uh, into um, animal models with um, Mike Diamond again, and um, and they do have a positive effect in which we maintain the weight, whereas um, untreated animals uh, lose weight. We decrease the virus, and especially the lung, also to some degree in the, in the nasal wash, if you do that prophylactically, and uh, you also see, you know, a, a major effect doing therapy one day later. And again, the histopathology, uh, much more open lungs when you're antibody treated, whereas you have consolidated lungs, which is pneumonia, um, with the isotype treated animals. And we even looked out at uh, two days, and there you see 
uh, not so much effect. You do have a survival benefit, but the, the weight loss is quite severe and the effect on viral titers is modest. And now you're picking up some, some histopathology, not as bad as untreated. So the, the later you wait to treat with this type of antibody, the less effect you're going to have. And so those were sort of exploratory, um, studies that we did with, um, NTD antibodies. And then, uh, we said, well, wow, are there even, um, more antigenic sites in NTD than we originally saw? So I just want to introduce you to another uh, technology called linking B cell receptor to antigen specificity through sequencing or LibraSeq. This was a, a new technology I reported in Cell a year or two ago by our colleague at Vanderbilt, Evelyn Georgiev and his team. And so this is a technique in which um, a DNA barcode is added to a protein and used for cell sorting and then single cell um, uh, recovery of antibody genes. So you, you take an antigen and then you um, use a, an oligonucleotide or a DNA barcode and you, you add that to the protein antigen. So now you have protein antigen, but it also has a DNA that can be um, recognized by PCR and sequencing. And of course, you can use a fluorophore uh, for sorting. And so um, by adding sorting and barcoding activities, you can uh, do flow sorting. And then those uh, cells are put into uh, a single cell device for recovering through single cell RNA-seq. Typically, we're using 10x genomics uh, instrument. And again, this is the reference from Setliff uh, et al. in Cell 2020 about the actual technique. I think um, Evelyn's group did it with flu and maybe HIV originally, but pro the project I'm showing you today is uh, done with um, SARS-CoV-2. And what's interesting is Evelyn's group had um, was able to barcode not only SARS-CoV-2 in the first column, but SARS-1, MERS, MERS S1 domain, seasonal viruses like OC43, HKU1, and even HIV antigens as uh, controls. And uh, also because of the way the sequencing is done, you can see isotypes like IgG, IgA1, A2, D, IgG1, 2, 3, and even IgMs. Uh, so here's the sorting where you, you sort um, antigen positive um, cells out of the CD19 positive B cell population. Um, and then you, um, you can run uh, various populations through expansion, um, activation in confirmation or directly in a 10x genomics. Um, and um, we were able to recognize with various platforms <laughs> Uh, of course, antibodies all over the place. Um, and again, this is the, the panel of antigens that uh, Evelyn's group was using with um, the donor cells. And these the, the panel of antigens was made by Jason McClellan's lab, UT Austin. Um, and so this is sort of a schematic of how the, the labeling might be done with two antigens, but of course it could be done with more than that. Um, Mix the B cells with the antigens, sort, pool, 10x genomics, next generation sequencing, and then a, a proprietary bioinformatics um, program with LibreSeq to identify. Now, we looked at various donors that we had been studying at the Vanderbilt Vaccine Center uh, post-COVID um, or COVID vaccination, and these are plasma or serum tests using dilutions on the x-axis and uh, OD at 450 on the y-axis, and uh, the SARS-CoV-2 NTD is shown in green. And so we found this donor in 1989 who had a, a relatively high uh, serum profile for NTD, and uh, we went on and did authentic virus nude on the left or um, the recombinant uh, replication competent VSV uh, neutralization assay on the right, and we looked at this individual day 18, day 28, day 56, or uh, day 90 after infection. And the, the seropositivity of neutralizing antibody was quite high throughout all of the course over the first three months. Um, and so we used uh, B cells from this individual 
um, to uh, look for um, a prefusion stabilized uh, a six six proline uh, stabilization format of spike protein and also the NTD um, uh, reagent, and that way you can find. Um, NTD specific that also bind a spike protein. We found 102 cells um, that were IgG1, 2, or 3, and then the rest we saw were IgA and D. And there's sort of two columns here. Um, this is SARS CoV, you know, CoV2, RBD, NTD, spike protein, and SARS1 spike protein, and then repeating those. And then in, in highlight are the ones we found that were. Um, neutralizing. So we found more neutralizing clones. Uh, we did various analyses. Most of these interesting, if you look at these violin plots with identity to infer germline, are in fact uh, nearly germline antibodies. Um, we also looked at the IGHV or the heavy chain variable gene usage of these antibodies. And um, you see a wide diversity of antibodies responding to NTD. But um, in fact, there's some overrepresented genes that are 169 or 124 that are seen uh, more than others. Um, and the 124 turns out to be a public clonotype where we see a, a handful of antibodies that use that, um, that particular uh, antibody uh, variable gene and uh, they bind to NTD and spike protein and the bioinformatics scores are quite high. So it's interesting there appears to be a public clonotype that binds to NTD. Um, if we look at these antibodies by uh, binding um, and, uh, and then calculate from the binding curves, um, the, um, the EC50 of binding, they, they bind quite well. If we calculate nanogram per ml, IC50 of neutralization on the right, we see some of these are single digit or in the teens for neutralization. So they're very potent antibodies, uh, even though they're to NTD. And again, they're a small subset of NTD antibodies, but it shows you that um, the initial reports that NTD was not really a neutralizing target are not true. It's just that there's a small subset of antibodies induced by infection that are neutralizing. Now we did, again, the competition assays that I've mentioned before with a first antibody that's unlabeled or blocking antibody now on the x-axis. The same antibodies, uh, whether NTD or some RBD controls, um, and uh, the percent blocking is shown here from 0 to 100. And you can see there's a large block that all recognize the major antigenic site. But there's this one antibody, 3434, that recognizes its own site. It only competes with itself. And so we thought that was quite interesting. So by doing a hundred more antibodies, we found one that uh, was neutralizing and recognized a unique site. Um, if we um, look um, again at the, the distribution of the uh, 124 antibodies, I mentioned there's sort of what appears to be a public clonotype. In fact, the, um, the um, uh, CDR3s are pretty diverse, as are the light chains. So, um, there's something about the 124 um, heavy chain variable gene that is beneficial, but it's not a single clonotype. Um, when we look at the um, the phylogen of these antibodies and the, the neutralizing ones that we see, uh, and compared to all the sequences out in sort of sequence space, you do see that both convalescent and vaccinated individuals make a convergent antibody response. Um, using this variable gene. So it's it's a very dominant response, and a lot of people make it, and we see it both in convalescent and in, in vaccinated individuals. So that's the gist of the work. Um, we've looked at RBD antibodies and NTD, and I think it just shows you that there's um, the ability to do rapid antibody response now to uh, something that have, occurs that you don't even anticipate, and, and many of the things I've shown you illustrate current principles of antibody discovery. Um, in this day and age for viruses. Of course, good science is team science. This is a picture of our team uh, in 2019 at the very end, right before all this happened, um, when we were not yet wearing masks. 
Uh, I mentioned many of the collaborators, even Evelyn Georgiev, Michael Diamond at WashU, Ralph Barrick at UNC, Dan Baruch at Beth Israel. Uh, we've done uh, escape mutations in mapping with Jesse Bloom's lab. I, I alluded to that, but didn't um, speak of that. Um, sample uh, collaborations from Union Lee, Emery, Helen Chu, and Mario Ostrowski at Toronto. Uh, the pharma development that um, I discussed uh, with AstraZeneca as was led by Mark Kesser uh, and his team of very talented uh, antibody developers and clinical trialists. Um, Freeman Lab at, at Maryland did neutralizations with us, and Pei Yang Chi uh, gave strains. We've worked with uh, many companies in this work, especially Berkeley Lights. I want to thank them for their great collaboration. Also, 10X Genomics helped us in the heat of the moment with um, with expertise and extra instruments. Twist Bioscience has been a great partner for synthesis. We've gotten funding from NIH, Merck, Future Insight Prize, DARPA P3. Um, um, NIAID has been a, a, a funder of this work. Uh, and then three company partners, AstraZeneca, ID Biologics, Ology, and even our lo local celebrity, Dolly Parton, um, contributed to this work. And uh, thank you for uh, spending time with us and uh, listening to this work, and I appreciate your attention. And um, hope you enjoy the, the rest of the Lab Roots uh, conference. Bye-bye.